There are two basic motivating forces, fear and love. When we are afraid, we pull back from life. When we are in love, we open to all that life has to offer with passion, excitement and acceptance. We need to learn to love ourselves first in all our glory and our imperfections. If we cannot love ourselves, we cannot fully open our ability to love others or our potential to create. Evolution and all hopes for a better world rest in the fearlessness and open-hearted vision of people who embrace life. And that was said by John Lennon. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I'll be your host for the next hour. And some very wise words there from John Lennon, folks. It is so important that people embrace life, because when people embrace life, that is where the solutions to all our problems lie. It wasn't until I began to embrace my life that all the solutions presented themselves in my life. And believe me, folks, my life was not always a good thing. In my younger years in life, I was my own worst enemy. I really was hard on myself. I was very down on myself. I didn't like myself. Even my voice, I didn't like my voice because my voice didn't sound like other people's voices. I didn't like the fact that I was tall because I was taller than the average person. I didn't like the fact that I didn't really fit in anywhere within society. I just couldn't make it work. I desperately wanted to make society work for me, and I just couldn't make it work. And I felt very, very different to other people. I had huge difficulties with my relationships with people. There didn't seem to be any real substance. It seemed that it was often about collecting stuff and social status. I must have spent quite literally hundreds and hundreds of hours of my life in tears when I was young. When I was younger, I cried so many tears for the world and for my lack of understanding of the world and my lack of ability to fit into the world that it was just unimaginable. And it wasn't until I really stepped back and began to objectively look at the world and look at society, mainly because I was desperate to find out why I didn't fit in, how come all these other people could make it work and they could make a profit and they could gain all this status and they could have all this stuff, but I couldn't make it work. What was wrong with me? And these are the questions that I was asking, and it wasn't until I really began to step back and look at society objectively that I began to realize that I couldn't make it work because I wasn't a sociopath. And that is not to say that I'm saying that anybody who has a successful business and anybody who is successful, anybody who has made it, in inverted commas, is a sociopath. Not at all. It's just that the need to profit from people in order to function within this society is itself sociopathic. It's the imposition of commerce itself, which forces people to conduct business in a sociopathic manner. Otherwise, the business cannot function as a business. But I just felt things too deeply in my life to be able to profit from people. I tried profiting from people. I tried doing business deals and making money on the side and doing all this sort of stuff, and it just didn't work. I could never do it. I could never do it and feel any degree of comfort in myself. I always felt like I'd done the wrong thing because I'd made a profit from somebody. And even now when I look back at it, I can see that most of the deals that I tried to do, they all went wrong in some way or other anyway. So it's almost as if the universe was trying to tell me that, I shouldn't be doing things this way. It's not about commerce. It just took me a little while to learn the lesson. And even when I was a child, I could never understand why money ever got in the way of fixing a problem. When I was a child, I remember the adverts on TV, the main adverts we used to see for World Vision and organizations such as that were always talking about the starving millions in Ethiopia when I was a child. And I could never understand how anybody could be starving in this world and my mother would say well, it's because we can't afford to feed them and they can't afford to feed themselves and I could just never understand what money had to do with it I could never understand why commerce would interfere with someone being fed 
It just didn't make sense to me. And this was before I had even started school. This is when I was about four years old, or possibly five years old, but it was before I was going to school, and we just got a television set. And I remember saying to my mother one day, I said, but mum, at the end of the day when we've done all of our shopping and we've come home with our food and everybody else has done all their shopping and gone home with their food, there's still all of this food left in the stores. All we have to do is take half of all that and send it over to these people in Ethiopia and they won't be starving anymore. It's really simple. And she would look at me and say how sweet it was and what a lovely gesture it was, but it just didn't work that way. And I could never understand why. And so I grew up through this society wondering how I can make this work, how I can make it fit in to my life, to my thought patterns, how I can make myself fit into it. Halfway through my school years, I realized that it just wasn't going to happen. I could never figure this stuff out. I could just never understand what this society was about. And I just couldn't do what it wanted me to do. And there had to be a better way. There had to be a way of expressing the art of my life. And so I became a musician, and I spent most of my life as a musician. And I spent most of my time researching ancient history on the side when I wasn't playing guitar or mixing front of house for some band. And all through these years, I did, on occasion, attempt to step back into society and try to do it, try to get a place to live and start conducting business and getting a job and doing all the things that normal people do. And I could just never make it work because I simply could not get my mind to function within that type of reality. To me, it was just too superficial. There was no way to express the art of my life. I felt like I was stepping away from myself in order to mold myself into something that I wasn't. Every time I attempted to work within that system. That's the way I felt. So I always fell back on music, back on playing guitar or back on mixing front of house or back on selling artwork. I sold a lot of artwork on the streets and in markets for a couple of years there as well. But what I'm attempting to say here is that it wasn't until I really put down all of the external stuff that I'd been measuring myself up to all of the parameters that society had set me and began to really just do what my heart told me to do and embrace the experience of life itself, that life began to unfold for me. And the reason I've brought you that story about my dysfunctional youth is because there are many people out there that I perceive to be having similar experiences and who are very down on themselves because of these experiences and who judge themselves poorly because of their inability to fit into a society which is essentially sociopathic because it is a sociopathic society, folks. And I'm reminded of a wonderful quote by Judy Krishnamurti that said, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And that is exactly what we've got. And if you are a person out there and you simply cannot make this society work, well, now you know why. It's probably because you are, in fact, sane when most of society is exactly the opposite. You see, most of society is in a state of collective hypnosis. Most of society believes the commercial system is real. And the imposition of the commercial system over the mind of man is really the biggest problem that we face. It's the source of all of the difficulties that we currently see on this planet. And it is one of the most difficult things, one of the most difficult mental states to break people out of. Because many people on the planet, many, many people, the vast majority of people on the planet simply cannot imagine what life could be or how life could even be were it not for commerce, because commerce has been so deeply ingrained into their mentality, the need to pay to be alive, the need to pay for everything that you use or do, the mere concept that time itself is worth money, is a huge problem, and it's the source of all of the difficulties we face, and as I said, it is the most difficult thing to break people out of, because it is so ingrained into people's psyche that they cannot perceive of what life without commerce would be like, or even that it could possibly be. 
for many people, the whole meaning of their life is commerce. This is what they spend every moment doing, is collecting paper, collecting more digits in their bank account, collecting more numbers on the screen. And our society has been structured in such a way so as the more numbers you have on the screen, then the more respect you have from society, regardless of how you obtained those numbers and who had to suffer due to your actions along the way. As long as those actions were done through subsidiary companies and your actual hands are clean through legal loopholes, it's all good. It doesn't matter. You've got all the dollars, and so we love you. And that's just the way our society's been structured, folks. And this, of course, is designed to create exactly the type of world that we see today. And so the question is, what do we do about it? Here we are. What can we do about this situation? Well, the first hurdle to overcome is to, of course, become aware of the situation. That really is the first hurdle. I mean, I speak about the problems that we have in the world very often on the show, but I do so simply because you need to be aware of the problems, and I believe that when you look at these problems from the correct perspective, you find the information to be actually quite empowering. I do, folks. I don't get depressed over any of the stuff that I talk about on the shows. I find all of the information to be empowering because I believe knowledge is power, and with the knowledge of what the problems are, you then have the ability to deal with these problems. So, okay, how do we deal with the problem? Well, we deal with the problem by first becoming aware of it, by disseminating the information to the people around us, and by questioning authority on every single occasion that we are able to do so. Any single thing, this council, this government, state government, federal government, any person who claims to have any authority over you, you need to question their actions, question why they believe they have authority over you, question why you have to pay this fine, why these new rates have come in, why this new council tax is in place. Question all of these things, folks. We need every person on the planet to start doing this. Start writing letters to your government and start questioning every single thing they do. That's step two. And please understand here, folks, that I'm calling it step two because I have said that it's what you should do after you become aware, which I happen to mention first, so we can call that step one. But really, these are things that you can do in sync altogether. They are all part of the same plan. There are really no steps. These are all things you should start doing. You absolutely should become aware of the problems, and you absolutely should start questioning authority on every single occasion that you can. And of course, above all else even, you should step into the art of your own life. Step into this experience. Realize that it's not about all the external stuff. It's about you. It's about what's in your heart. It's about the legacy you leave behind in this world. It's about what you do with the information that you've got and how you improve reality by your presence in it. Start leading by example in all that you do. Start living your life in Lakesh with everybody that you know. Start being a pleasure to be around. Start improving this world simply by the energetic state that you're in because of the zest and the love and the embrace that you have for this wonderful experience that we call life. Because life is not supposed to be a struggle. Life is not supposed to be an experience whereby you are measured by the amount of digits on the screen. You have to spend your time collecting stuff and trying to improve your social status because it is the only way you'll be viewed as being worthwhile by the rest of a corrupt society. You don't have to spend your life in that way, folks. You are here to be the unique expression of creation that is you and to experience and express the art of yourself. And that's what everybody on this planet should do. And just imagine if everybody did that. If everybody started doing that, then the world would change in one day. And I believe that's a huge part of it, folks. Coming to terms with yourself, realizing that you are perfect in all that you do and you have no reason to judge yourself by any of the parameters that have been set up by this society. Life is not about that. Life is far more than that. It's coming to these realizations, folks. This is what is needed in the world. This is a big part of it. Once we change our perspective and we start coming to these realizations and start embracing ourselves and embracing the art of our own life, then the world will change then we'll realize that we don't need government at all. As I've said many times recently, folks, in the world today, the only reason we really need government is to address all the problems that the government creates for us. So they've kind of 
create a situation whereby we need them to fix up their mess. And just realising that problem is a huge part of it as well, because that gives us the ability to step above that as well. You see, we can step above the system once we understand that the system is fiction, folks. Once we understand what's really going on in this world, we can step above it all. Once we realise that all we've got in this current social and economic system that we live under is a system of slavery, a system of human trafficking, once we realise exactly what's going on here, once we realise how much we've been led away from the art of ourselves and led away from the truth of ourselves and led away from ourselves in general by the system of commerce that's been imposed over our mentality, then we have a hope of creating a better future. But we've got to realise these things first. We've got to really step back and see things for what they are. And the commercial system really is the biggest problem that we face. It's the source of all of our difficulties, folks. When you look at all the corners that have been cut in production that have caused problems, when you look at all the corners that have been cut in industrial practices that have caused environmental catastrophes, all of these things have happened because of financial incentive. It's been far more profitable to pollute the environment, to destroy the world, than it has been to do otherwise. The only reason we have homelessness and the only reason we have starvation is because the commercial model has been superimposed over the mind of man whereby we would actually allow people to starve because there isn't the money to feed them. But you don't eat money, you eat food, and the food is right there, but these people can't have the food because they don't have the money. It's ridiculous. And even looking at a scenario like that, you can easily see what the real purpose of money is, and that is to create scarcity. I mean, sure, money can create abundance for those who have a lot of it, but they can only achieve that abundance by putting other people into a state of scarcity. Because people are only able to achieve monetary abundance or monetary prosperity, which is what it really is, rather than abundance. But they're only able to achieve this prosperity due to their exploitation of other people. So it's out of balance right from the onset, and there's no way it can ever be in balance. The imposition of a commercial system is always going to create a situation whereby there are haves and there are have-nots. And it creates that situation because that is the very purpose of the commercial system. The purpose of the commercial system is to create scarcity and to make more and more of humankind expendable so that more and more of humankind can be discarded along the way so that eventually the only population we have left are those people that are needed to run the machine. People talk about the big depopulation plan that's coming, and folks, it's already well underway, and it's being implemented via the economic model. That's what they do. They just go up the rungs of the ladder, and they expel more and more of humanity along the way, and nobody really notices what's going on on the lower rungs because they're all caught up in this social system whereby they're measuring themselves by their stuff, and those people that are being discarded, it's okay to discard them because... They're lesser people, and I can tell they're lesser people because they had less stuff than me. And that's the mentality of this society. And that's where the depopulation comes in, and it's happening right before our eyes, folks. It's happening every day. And it's happening in places that you wouldn't expect it to be happening, folks. It's happening to farmers here in Australia. If you really want to see depopulation in motion, folks, have a look at the coal seam gas industry. We've got the utterly corrupt New South Wales government in Australia now pushing this industry as the most important industry in New South Wales. In other words, the New South Wales government in Australia believes that the most important thing it can do for the people of its state is to destroy the water table in order to line their own pockets and to send all of Australia's natural resources straight off overseas for foreign corporations to profit from. This is the stance of the New South Wales government. These scumbags, folks, these criminals who actually believe that they have the power to destroy our water table and believe they're going to get away with it because they wrote rules in a book, this is the attitude that they're displaying against the people. Hopefully this will cause the people of New South Wales to wake up. Hopefully it will cause the people to view the New South Wales government as an entity that they have lost all confidence in and an entity that needs to step down to be replaced by people who have at least some degree of intelligence or at least enough intelligence to 
see the danger in destroying Australia's groundwater in order to support a fictional economic model, most especially when all of the economics that are being generated by the industry will in fact go straight overseas. And the loss of these farmers to supply Australia with food will of course ripple out to the communities in general across Australia and we'll see a huge rise in the cost of food because most of our food will need to be imported because our food bowl has been destroyed by this insanely corrupt and highly pollutive and incredibly environmentally toxic industry. And so ultimately coal seam gas will see a further degradation of the standard of living of the general population in Australia and a further erosion of any security that people have built up in their lives. And this, of course, ties in very much with Agenda 21 as well, because the goal is to push people into concentrated pockets of civilization such as cities. They don't really want people living in the country, folks, because it's very difficult to control people who are self-sufficient and living in a rural setting. And they don't really want people running private farms. They want big, huge monocrop farms all running GM food for the population, because Once they impose GM food over the population, they can marginalise different sections of population and they can control the population by simply controlling the genetics of the food that the people consume. As we've clearly seen from studies that have been conducted on animals, it will be very easy to marginalise and control sections of the population, indeed whole countries, by feeding them certain types of food because you can induce sterility within a certain population over three generations. These people will believe that they're getting good food, but over three generations you can reduce them to a state where they are now unable to breed. And they won't even realise that it's the food that's doing it to them. They'll just think there's some virus that's suddenly taken over their country and people seem to be having some sort of genetic problems. They'll never really attribute it to the food, or even if they do, it will be far too late. But as I said, we can see through studies that have been conducted on animals that this is exactly what genetically modified food does. It causes severe genetic damage to the subject, but it takes a series of generations for this damage to become apparent. And as I said, of course, then it's too late, folks, because what are you going to do? Say, oh, look, I believe your food's been causing this genetic damage with our population. And what's Monsanto and these companies going to do? They'll say, well, look, I'll tell you what, we don't think so, but just to keep you safe... We'll have a study. We'll conduct a 30-year study on the effects of this food to see what happens. But then, of course, in 30 years, everybody's dead, and there's no reason for them to complete the study. That's what they always do, folks. They go, oh, look, it's terrible that this problem's happening. We'll conduct a study over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years just to see what the results are, when we already know what the results are, which is why we're complaining to them in the first place. But they don't address the problem, folks. They just tie it up in red tape and bureaucracy and let things play their course. And very often people are programmed enough to think that once they've got a result that the government is actually conducting a study into it, then they've got a positive result and things are going to move forward. They don't realise that it's all part of the plan. The study has already been done and we know that the government's wrong, which is why you are sick in the first place, which is why you went to government to begin with. So, yes, folks, the study's already been done. You were the study. People just don't seem to think about things that way. And they always believe they have to petition government to bring about change, when really what we need to do is to step above the whole thing and rather than petition them to mandate that they implement the changes we want and if they refuse to do so, to dismiss them through the power of a united community. And that may sound like an impossibility, folks, but really it's not. Not if the community can unite and realise that all we are dealing with are people who wrote a whole bunch of silly rules in their silly books and they trained us to be silly enough to believe that their silly rules give them the ability to steal everything we own from us. And that's really the whole situation in a nutshell, folks. It's all basically a state of collective stupidity that we are in as a species, and we really do need to wake up to ourselves and put things right again, folks. We don't have to let government do anything that it's doing, and all we have to do to stop it is to remember who and what we are and stand in the power of our flesh. I've said that to you so many times before, and it may sound simplistic, but the fact is that it's true, folks. That's what we can do, because 
There isn't anybody on this planet who has any more or less worth or any more or less authority than anybody else. We are all in this together and we are all created equal. The choice of whether to claim that equality and to stand in that equality lies with each individual. It's just that we've been trained not to think that way. We've been trained to always be subservient to authority. This is what our scholastic years are all about, folks. That's the main purpose, apart from the fact that they train you to think in a left brain manner they also train you to always respect authority because it's essential to the smooth running of this system that we believe the authority is real that we believe the rules are real that we believe the laws are actually real and that we believe commerce is real if it wasn't for that this society and the slavery system that it supports could not function in any way shape or form Its functionality can only be achieved through the compliance of the people, and this can only be achieved by removing the people from any true knowledge of themselves. And that's what's been done, folks. It's been a very clever system. But really, when you step back and look at it, it becomes virtually transparent, and you can really see how the mechanism works. Because it's all a facade, folks. This whole legal, economic, social structure that enslaves us, it's just a facade, It's just a matrix. It's not real. And we don't have to do what these people say. In fact, quite the opposite. They're just public trustees, folks. That's all they are. And if we can put down our stuff with each other and unite as a community, we have the ability to change the world. We can do it today. We can do it tomorrow. We can do it any time we decide to put down our stuff with each other and participate in building a better future. It's really that simple. But I think we're at break time here now, folks, so I'll leave it there for now. It's a pleasure having your company with me on the show today, and I will speak to you again in a few minutes. Thanks for listening. And welcome back, folks. So the reason I went through my dysfunctional youth for you at the start of the broadcast today was because I wanted to point out to you how sometimes we are very insecure about our own uniqueness because that's really what was going on with me really when I look at it it was a product of television it was a product of the programming around me because I saw these images of people on the television who were a certain way and they looked pretty cool and you kind of when you're a kid you aspire to be like these people and I didn't see that I was anything like any of these people and so I felt myself to be a lesser person I was essentially repelled by my own uniqueness. I was essentially repelled by my own inability to be like the role models that had been put there for me to aspire to. And it took a very long time before I realized that this was quite literally a program that I'd been running. I'd been programmed when I was a child to believe that I had to be a certain thing and I had to behave in a certain way and I had to aspire to certain goals. And if I was not able to do so, I would never be successful because, of course, success is measured by social and financial status according to the parameters of this society. And yet I was simply not able to profit from people. Even when I was doing the right thing and it was all above board and that's the money that I was supposed to be getting, I still felt bad about selling something for more than I bought it for or for making something and selling it at all, because usually if I made something, I'd want to give it away. When I was younger, I did hundreds and hundreds of of very, very detailed drawings and pieces of artwork when I was a teenager, and I gave every single one of them away. Most of them I gave to the one person. She was kind of hanging around. Whenever I'd finish a picture, she'd say, thank you, and I'd give it to her, and she'd put it in her photo album. And she wasn't even my girlfriend. She was just a friend. She was just part of the crew that we used to hang around with. And so I've always found it very, very difficult to be able to profit from people. It's just not part of my psychological makeup. And every time I've tried to do it, it's always gone wrong. I just, I just, something happens and I just, I can't do it. I just much prefer to give things. It just feels natural to me to give. I remember when I was younger, I had a lot of friends who used to pay out on me because I gave so much. I would give something away and one of my friends would look at me and say, you're an idiot. Why do you do that? Why do you give everything you own away? You're a fool. You could have sold that to him. You're an idiot. You're never going to make it. 
And I just used to think, why would you sell something to a friend? Why would I want to turn one of my friends into a commodity? Why would I want to use them to profit from? Why, if I've got something here that they want that I don't particularly use anymore, would I not give it to them so they could experience the same pleasure that I did from that object when I did use it? Why would I want to, rather than give it to them, sell it to them and thereby remove some of that pleasure from them? Wouldn't it be more pleasurable for them as a gift? Why would I want to view every relationship as a business transaction? And like I said, folks, I tried for a while. I tried to do the things other people did, and I just couldn't do it. It just didn't work for me. Whenever I tried, it all went wrong, and I just couldn't ever do it. I just always believed that giving was the best thing to do. And I always believed that if we respected each other and we treated each other like ourselves, then all of these problems wouldn't exist. And this was way back when I was a teenager, I felt like this. And it just carried through into my adult years. Which I tell you folks, it makes for a pretty dysfunctional person. When you're that way, you think that way and you feel that way and you're trying to survive within this society, it's a pretty dysfunctional life that you're living. And in many ways, I would say that according to the parameters of this society, my life was very dysfunctional. But when I look at it as a human experience, I think it was highly functional. I think it was absolutely perfect because it brought me to where I am now. It brought me to the understandings that I have now. And without having those experiences, I would never have gained these understandings. I would never have gained the insights that I have. And the reason I've gone through all this, folks, is because I'm perceiving that there is a lot of people out there who feel the same way and a lot of people who judge themselves poorly when really it's because of their uniqueness and it's because they see their own uniqueness as being a flaw and separating them from what they think they should be according to the parameters of this society. But, folks, this society is dysfunctional. This society has nothing to do with supporting the human experience. It has nothing to do with helping you express the art of your life and everything to do with removing you from the art of your life and molding you into something that you're not, into a clone that society wants you to be and training you to function in a certain way whereby your actions benefit the ruling hand at the top, the slave masters who run the whole system. That's the way this society has been constructed. So if you're feeling that your uniqueness is detrimental to your health, your uniqueness is a handicap, then you're really looking at things from the wrong way. And again, you're only looking at things that way because you're programmed to look at things from that way. You're trained to look at things from that way. And it's very clever, folks. It's a very clever subliminal program that they've got running here because very often we will feel inspired by our uniqueness while judging ourselves poorly because we're different from everybody else at the same time. It's kind of like an opposing dichotomy that's happening within our minds, right there at the back of the minds. It's there in the subconscious, very often in a lot of people, and it's a program. Because really it is our uniqueness that is the most valuable thing that we have, each one of us. This is who you are. And so, of course, it is the most valuable thing that you have. Because the most valuable thing you have is your consciousness. The freedom to think what you want to think and to do what you want to do. The freedom to be as unique as you are able and to express yourself in a way that only you can. And this is everything that our society attempts to lead us away from. Because this society does not like independent thought. It does not like free thinking. It does not like new ideas because with a new idea comes a shift in the role of government. When people start introducing new ideas into the pot, then it means change, and change may mean that the government may lose its power over something. It can't have change. You can't implement a new idea unless we can find a way of regulating that idea so that it fits within these little parameters and we can tax it. That's what government's about, and it's all designed to remove you from the human experience and to squash the uniqueness of yourself, to put you in a position where you are never able to fully express the art of your own life and never able to realize your own creative potential. That is exactly what this society is designed to do. It doesn't care about people. It cares about the system. It cares about industry. Like I was mentioning in the start of the show, what's going on here with coal seam gas mining? This ridiculously sociopathic New South Wales environmental minister, I think his name's Ian McFarlane, has said that this is the most important industry to this state. Folks, there is no such thing as an important industry. What is important is people. No industry is important, not if people suffer at the hands of that industry. 
Again, folks, it's just a matter of perspective. Mankind created industry to service mankind. So, of course, industry is not more important than mankind. And if mankind is suffering due to the actions of said industry, then that industry needs to be closed down immediately. To me, that's just common sense, regardless of whatever damage it does to whatever fictional economic model, because it is fiction. And commerce should not be allowed to interfere with the human experience. Commerce is simply a means of trade. It's nothing more. It is certainly not the be-all and end-all. And the economy, I believe, is the least important thing in any country. And many people may be shocked in that statement. They may be shocked and wonder how anyone could possibly think something so ridiculous as the economy being unimportant. But that is simply because these people are locked into the left brain and they are fully locked into the system of commerce that has been superimposed over the human psyche. Because the system of commerce is a very, very insidious thing, and once it has been introduced over the human psyche and superimposed over reality, then anybody who has used that system finds it very, very difficult to think of life without commerce. It's almost like a mental virus or a psychic parasite that infects people's minds, and once they get locked into that way of thinking, they just can't break free of the program. It's a very, very strong program, folks, and I find it fascinating to see how dependent people are upon the economic model and the links they will go to to defend the economic model, discarding humanity all along the way in order to balance the books. To them, that is the most important thing. These books must be balanced, but all these books are are little ink spots on pieces of paper or digital numbers on a computer screen. They don't mean anything. They're not real You can't eat them, you can't sleep under them, you can't build with them, you can't do anything with them. All they do is place people in a state of scarcity because the numbers say that's what it must be. The system of commerce that has been superimposed over the mind of mankind is a pathogen, folks, a psychic pathogen that has been responsible for all the death, destruction and devastation, loss of life and environmental damage that we have seen on this planet. It alone has reduced the human experience and the planet that we live on to what we see before us today. And we alone are the only ones with the ability to rectify this problem and to rein our governments in and to steer the ship of state back in the direction that it should be going, a direction that will lead back to human freedom take us full circle back to where we should be. And this, of course, is a lot of what I hope to achieve with the Full Circle Project that I intend to launch later in the year, folks, and that will need audience participation. If you want to get involved in it, then you can do so in your own town. You don't even need me to come there. That's the way I want to organise it. I just want to put out a, a template, and I need help from people. I need suggestions from people, and I need support from people to do it because we need to find a way of empowering the community and a way that empowers each individual within the community so that the movement that is started is a movement of consciousness where there are no leaders. It is an idea whose time has come, and that's what we have to do. We've got to realize that we cannot allow ourselves to remain enslaved to a paper-based reality that is destroying the world around us. We cannot allow politicians to say that there's no way to roll back fluoride in the water because it's done, the deal is done and it cannot be turned back. That's literally what they said here again in New South Wales in Australia, folks. The New South Wales minister said that it doesn't matter who wants to take fluoride out of the water in the state, there's no way to roll it back because the deal has been made. And that's what they think, folks. That's how deranged these politicians are. They literally believe that we can't just turn the tap off and take the tanks off the water system because some sociopathic politician wrote some gibberish down on a piece of paper. That's what they believe. And I think that any politician who actually believes that should be up for a psychiatric evaluation, personally. Because we can roll everything back, folks. It doesn't matter what they wrote down on pieces of paper. Because that's all it is. It's just some sociopath's idea that he put down as a new means of controlling the human experience. And we don't have to let them get away with it. 
However, I do believe that the only way we can ever stop them getting away with it is to rediscover ourselves and choose to do things differently. And again, folks, this will only ever come from respect, won't it? It'll only come when people start respecting their own uniqueness and respecting the uniqueness of others. And I know that I've beat this drum on this show for six years now to the point that it must be getting monotonous, folks. But I don't know, I just, I have this information in my head and I I can see it so clearly how to save every man, woman and child on this planet and, and change the direction we're going in if people could see the reality of what I'm saying and see the need to change the direction that we're going in. And sometimes I wonder what it will take for mankind to listen to this message and to see the way out that is so clear before them. It is so clear and it is so simple how to fix this situation, folks. It really is. If people could just put down their stuff and change their perspective, then we could change the world in one day. I really do believe this. And those who attack me and say, you say all this stuff, but you don't provide us with any solutions, have to understand that I don't have the solution for you. You have the solution for you. And the solution for you is you. All you have to do is realize the potential of yourself. This is what I've been attempting to bring to people for six years now on these radio shows, folks. And that is the solution. There is no paper you can fill out. There is no movement to join. The movement is you. The movement is a movement of consciousness. You have to be prepared to change your perspective and to look at things differently and to step into it, step into the role. Don't just be a passive observer. Look at things for what they are and approach things from the correct perspective. Don't be led down the path of some movement by whatever controlled opposition is put there for you to follow. Here in Australia, lock the gate, all this sort of stuff. Why are they trying to address coal seam gas mining from a legal perspective? Why can't they see that all the legal system is are words written on pieces of paper by the same sociopaths that started the industry and want the industry to go forward and that they've written these so-called laws in order to tie you up in red tape so that you're not able to stop the industry and as soon as you choose to step above it and realise that these politicians are in breach of trust for even doing what they did, there is your solution... Why can't people see that? Because that is the solution. There is no remedy in the legal system. There never will be remedy in the legal system for any problem that we face. The real problem that we face is commerce. That's why coal seam gas is happening, because of commerce. That's why all of the mining and destruction and the rape of this planet is happening. It's order to support the economic model. It's all about commerce. That's why people are homeless. It's about commerce. That's why people are rulers and we have tyrants through society is because of commerce. That's why we have governments. That's why we have wars. That's why we have destruction of the environment. That's why we have starvation. It's all because of commerce. Why can't people realize that? Why can't people realize what the commercial system actually is? All this is a mechanism by which mankind is disinherited from their heritage, disinherited from who they are, disinherited from what is there for them, disinherited from the abundance that the earth provides for us naturally by its own means, all because of the commercial system, all because of commerce whereby we judge each other, we profit from each other, we steal from each other, we spend our lives attempting to gain different rungs on the social ladder because we believe that's what reality is. It's a joke, folks, and it is not what mankind is. It is not who you are. And I would ask every man, woman and child who listens to this show to just stop and take a moment and look around you and see the beauty of the people, see how they're struggling, see what they're caught up in, see what this society is and see what it's doing to this planet and realize how easily we could fix it if we simply respected each other. You know, everything we've created, this whole social system, folks, it's all a creation of mankind. It's all a creation of our imagination, a creation of our mind. And we've created a system whereby we are the least important thing within its parameters. And this is not acceptable. And it is not acceptable to have our environment destroyed around us. Our environment is our wealth. Our environment is our health. Our environment is who we are. We can't live a full life, a complete life, a healthy life if we don't have a healthy environment to live in. And we cannot afford to allow politicians to destroy our environment in order to balance their books and support their economic models simply because they wrote stuff down on paper. This is the real problem, folks. This is something that I've been beating to death on this show for years now. This is such a problem. 
that people cannot see above this ridiculous legal system. They think it's real. It's not. It's paper. It's not real. And the sheer stupidity of our police forces these days, these people who are actually putting on uniforms and daring to claim that they're protecting society and they're going out there and are allowing and supporting corporate corruption and the rape of this country and the discarding of human life within this country simply because some sociopathic politician wrote something down on a piece of paper, these people are literally some of the most stupid people in our society, folks, and this, again, is a huge problem. So how do we deal with that? Well, we can only deal with that via a united community. And we have to stand up and speak eloquently about this and stand up and speak publicly about it and stand up and say the right things to the right people. We've got to be able to explain to people in a calm, rational way what's going on and try to break people out of this fictional reality that they're living in, this paper-based world that they think is real. And it just boggles my mind, folks, how anybody could allow the environment to be destroyed around them because someone wrote some rubbish down on paper. It just blows my mind how people can think this is real and how willing they are to comply with this system. And, yeah, I get pretty passionate about some of these issues, folks, and I get very outspoken about it. I tend to almost scream about it sometimes. But I try to be polite, I try to be eloquent, I attempt to explain things in a nice way, but sometimes I just get frustrated. It's like John Lennon once said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said that if you're drowning, you don't put up your hand and say you'd really appreciate if someone would just look your direction and come and rescue you. You scream. And that's kind of what I do when I look at the world around me. I mean, it's all very well for me to politely ask if we could please pay attention and fix this problem, but it's getting to the point now where I just feel like screaming about it because it's important that people wake up out of their slumber and start paying attention to what's happening here. And I really believe the only way we can fix it, folks, is by knowing who we are. This is the only way. There is no legal remedy. And that's why I've done so much work on these shows in an attempt to help people rediscover themselves. And it is a rediscovery. It's not even a discovery. It's a rediscovery. It's a remembering of who you are. You know, because people are just locked out of this reality. They've forgotten. That's it. It isn't that they don't know. I think that the reason I've had so much success with the shows is because what I am saying on the shows is stuff that people do know. They do know it's real. They know that it's there. It's there within them. It's there locked in their genetic code. It's there in their cellular memory. They know that what I'm saying is true, and they remember it when you prompt them to remember. And that's why I've done things the way I've done it. I believe that's why I've had so much success with the show, because all I've ever done is speak common sense. And I believe that when people hear the message, they can see the reality of it, and they can see how simple it would be for us to actually fix all of the problems that we face. And knowing the things that I know, what else am I to do, folks? I have to speak out about this. I have to attempt to help wake people up because what other choice do I have? The only other choice that I have is to do nothing. And for me, that's not an option because I can't know what I know and sit idly by and watch the world be destroyed around me when I can see that the remedy to fixing this entire situation is so incredibly simple. And it's something that everybody can participate in right now. It isn't anything you have to learn. It isn't any form you have to fill out. There isn't any movement to join. There isn't anybody to write to. There isn't any protest to go to. All you have to do is change your perspective, start respecting people around you, and disseminate information throughout your community. And the best way to do that, folks, is to lead by example in all that you do. Be a pleasure to be around. Be someone that people want to be in your company because you help them, you inform them, and you are a pleasure to be around because of the high energetic state that you're in. Because you know this information and it's empowered you and you now know who you are and you know how to fix the problems of the world because you know that all you have to do is apply yourself to the reality in which you live in a respectful manner. That is the key to the whole thing. Don't put commerce over the human experience. Put the human experience over commerce. And wherever you can, forget about commerce. Give all you can to people, folks. Give to your community. Give to the people around you. Give to yourself. Don't give to the point that you deplete yourself. Of course, you must give to creation, and you are creation too. Give equally to all, including yourself. This is where the remedy lies. And this is what I've tried to bring to people on these shows for so many years now. Forgive me if I repeat myself, but 
I really feel the world is in a desperate situation. And I repeat myself because once you find what the remedy is, I see little point in going off on tangents and exploring other methods which have already been proven not to work. And so that's why I have stuck to this same message and that's why I've continued to do what I do because I really believe that mankind will wake up. Mankind will get the message and we will change the direction that we're going in. I really do believe that human consciousness is about to come online and it's about to come online big time in a big way. I think that everything these psychopaths that run the world are doing is just promoting this awakening. I think it's making things so obvious that people can't help but wake up. And that's why I continue to do what I do. And please accept my most humble thanks and my deepest gratitude to those of you who have taken this message on board and who continue to share this message with those in their community and the people around them. Because it's up to you folks. We need audience participation. We need global participation in this new perspective that we all need to adopt. And something else that I wanted to point out to much of the truth community out there, there's a lot of people out there that are speaking out against this system, pointing the finger at government and saying how much we need to bring it down. But they're not empowering the individual. They're not empowering the community in their talk. And if we do bring down the Western system, folks, what happens then? If the community is not empowered in the knowledge of who and what they are, what happens to the people in our societies if society does come down? Because with the current mindset, all it would do would be create chaos and create a power vacuum for someone like Russia or China or any oppressive regime to step right in and begin to shape to what they wanted it to be. So... Those people in the truth community who are simply pointing the finger and not attempting to at least create some path to dialogue which may lead to a solution are really being part of the problem. And I don't believe many of them realize the danger that they are flirting with. Because at the moment we have a world that is run by very powerful interests and these powerful interests don't care about human life and they will do anything they can to control anything they can control. And so if we are going to stand up and step up and take a swipe at this system, we really need to make sure that we're empowered in what we do. And that is only going to come from knowledge of ourselves, the knowledge of ourselves that I've been attempting to share with you this whole time. And believe me, folks, I'm not your leader. I don't want to be your leader. No one can lead you. You need to lead yourself. Everybody needs to lead themselves because this revolution that we need to have can only come about through an evolution in consciousness. People have to change their perspective. They have to change the way they perceive themselves and the way they perceive their interaction with reality to be because that's where the remedy lies. And without that, and without some sort of a focus on that, all the truth movement is going to create is the totalitarian state that it is speaking out against. So be careful, folks, with what information you assimilate and be careful whether you're assimilating information that leaves you disempowered or whether it's information that leaves you empowered. And if you feel empowered, folks, hopefully you're being empowered into action. Don't be empowered into some new age belief that you can save the world by sitting idly by and changing your energetic state and not applying it to reality. You have to apply it to reality in order for it to work. But I think we're out of time now, folks, so I'm going to have to leave it there. Thank you to everybody who joined me on the show today. This was a very personal show, and I got a lot of stuff said that I really have wanted to say for a long time. And so I thank you very much for listening. Thank you again to anybody who has ever helped with the website or made a contribution. They are very sorely needed at the moment, folks, and I really do want to launch this Full Circle project next year. So any contribution anybody can make would be greatly appreciated. I think we have to make a difference this year, folks, and I want to get as many people on board as I can to help do so. But that is it for me, folks. I'm completely out of time. I will look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please take good care until then. In La Keshe.